no industry changes faster than modern marketing. Great marketers need an edge. Great marketers need to be brave. The Brave Marketer podcast provides an opportunity for each guest to share a story where they exhibited bravery by taking a risk that made a dramatic impact in the market. Our guests are marketers from top brands and agencies who share the exact strategies and tactics they used in their brave marketing moment. We then dive deep into topics like ethical advertising, consumer privacy, crypto marketing, brand safety, and navigating a future without third-party cookies. Hosted by Brave Software and me, Donnie DeVoren, head of sales at Brave. Together, we'll get a backstage view of the brave marketing moments and creative mindset work that's shaping today's most influential brands. You're listening to a new episode of the Brave Marketer Podcast. Thank you so much for joining this week. This one is with Dylan Boyd. And Dylan is a connector. He loves connecting different people together. He knows everybody in the industry. And he's currently the director of RGA Ventures. So RGA Ventures is a corporate venture fund where he works with global brands to develop in-house and partner in venture studio programs. He works across a bunch of different verticals, sports, blockchain, health, pets, CPG, media, data, marketing. And Dylan has built startup companies. He's built global e-commerce initiatives, online business solutions for large corporations and major brands with integrated content and strategy programs. And with no further ado, here's today's episode of The Brave Marketer. Dylan, welcome to The Brave Marketer Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Donnie. Oh, good. So excited to have you on. We met a while ago back in Portland when I first started at Brave, I want to say exactly two years ago. Exactly. Yeah. It's good to see you again. So to just jump into it, why don't you tell our audience what's the most exciting thing you're working on right now? And the thing that I'm most excited about right now is probably the fact that it's um, summer and I live in Portland, Oregon, and I'm just got off a, uh, a few day trip kayaking and, and rafting on the Rogue River, in the middle of nowhere, retesting myself if I have survival abilities, basically. But I'm working on a project right now with BF Corporation uh, that owns a lot of brands, North Face, Smart Wool, Supreme, and others, looking at some EIR challenges with them and exploring how to get people back engaged in the outdoors, how to get people comfortable with going outside more. And it might sound weird to you or to to others that are used to exploring in the wilderness or going on hikes or camping, but there's quite a bit of America that still doesn't uh, know where to start there. Kind of interesting challenge for me to work on and take off my hat of normal outdoor explorer and uh, figure it out from the outside in. Yeah. What were some of the ideas that have come up so far? There's a, there's a lot. I think the number one thing comes down to education, right? There's a, an interesting conversation I had with a gentleman on the East Coast the other day, just doing some background and research. And the idea was they teach outdoor school for adults. And I said, what's the most popular class that you, you teach in all these, these urban cities? He goes, outdoor wilderness survival is the number one taking course. Like, why do you think that is? Like, so people are afraid they're going to die. And that's the truth. I mean, you take it for granted. If you weren't raised camping, skiing, hunting, whatever it might be, what happens if you get lost in the woods? Could you survive for the next 72 hours? That's the the number one class that people take. And I was like, that's fascinating. Even though I went to school in Vermont and I'm a big skier, I wouldn't want to be left on that mountain overnight alone. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So as you know, this is called the Brave Marketer and you are a marketer at RGA and you have a lot of big brands and you have a really brave story about your work with Kettle Foods. Can you tell our audience about that experience? There's a lot of times you work in, in the ad agency world or the creative world or even software and technology world where everyone always wants the thing we call the never been done before. You've probably seen it many times. It's like, yeah, we want to do this, but what has no one done that we could do this time around? And this is one of those moments when I was thinking back through all the kind of never been done before moments of what we had pushed the envelope on. And it was taking a consumer packaged goods company, Kettle Foods, you're used to all their wild flavored chips you see now, every flavor under the sun and taste and spice and you name it all over the U.S., 
but it was a smaller company back then. And, you know, I was a big fan of it. And we were asked to think about how they could get out of the same book of flavors they've been doing over and over again for so many years and how they could get more adventurous with people. And it was really the, the beginning days of the internet, to be honest. This was in the mid nineties. This was early two thousands, but a lot of the things that we're so used to today didn't exist back then. And a lot of it come, came down to personalization, right? Uh, and being able to serve the customer with what they want, when they want, how they want. We had an idea of bringing out an entire kitchen of spices and flavors and combinations and opportunities, but letting the world vote on it and using the internet to do that, not doing in-store sampling like they normally would or focus groups, but really just put it out there to the fan. I was just guessing what a flavor would taste like. It was a stretch back then. A lot of times you work with a brand, you push them to do something new and different that's outside their comfort zone. And I think it's similar to what Brave's doing in a lot of cases right now, changing the narrative of how ads are served and how people are engaged with them. And this was that same type of moment for us was looking at how would this be successful? And the worst thing you could do is fail and fail miserably in front of a, a client brand and lose that work right for the coming year. But it was a, a delightful surprise where we got tens of thousands of people digitally to vote and to help understand what a flavor would taste like. What does a Kung Pao chicken kettle chips taste like? You have no clue. You know what Kung Pao chicken tastes like, but you're not quite sure how to taste on a potato chip. Now there's a lot more outrageous things that have been done up there, but it was early days. And when we finally came up with the final flavors that stuck, we printed all of the names of all the voters on the bags of the chips. I still actually have them on my shelf 12 plus years later. Probably not edible at this point in time, but I've saved the, the packaging because it was just really interesting when you got that chip. No matter what, when you pick up that bag, we saw so much early pre-Twitter, early, early social media feedback of, oh my God, I voted and my name's on this bag of chips. This is so amazing. So it's figuring out how to connect using digital on a personalized basis. And you think that all the other personalization that came after, you think it was because of uh, Kettle or have you heard anything anecdotally that it was? Yeah, we saw rapidly other chip companies, major CPGs embrace that idea after it got written up in a lot of places and it got a lot of attention of just pushing the envelope of something that was radically new. And we saw a lot of other CPG companies follow afterwards. And, you know, it is what it is. They could have been working on it in tandem at the same time. But quite often when you see something like this, fast follows uh, in the industry. Were there any metrics that you could rely on that showed that it was a, a pure success? And here's number one, sales, right? With a CPG and a store shelved product, you can see massive amount of sales based on sell through. And that was the one. I mean, we could have come up with the worst flavors ever that we thought that everyone voted for the perception online of what, what was created and what was actually delivered. Speaking of a brand that sells a lot, and I'm a customer of theirs, is Verizon. And you actually ran a Verizon campaign with Brave. And I remember it featured Dave Matthews and there was a whole giving back component to it. Can you tell the audience a bit more about that campaign, the strategy, and maybe any of the outcomes? Yeah, and I worked on the coordination of looking at this campaign from a, a new opportunity and visibility way. And that's why I selected Brave as opposed to tr the traditional media sources we might already implement. I thought it really matched up well with the audience for those that had high music, musical taste. They had an engagement. We're definitely online users, higher probably indexing than, than others. And also the gaming side, there's a few different events that happened with gaming, with sports, with Dave Matthews and with others that we wanted to make sure we promoted. This was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And it wasn't my idea. This was the idea of RGA and the team that worked on this was to how could they bring concerts home, which now seems like a commonplace, right? Two years later. But at that moment, music stopped, live music ended, and people were missing it. And people were missing being with other people. And Verizon as a, a kind of a, you know, really doubles and triples down a community over and over again. And they said, what can we do in this moment? And not only just providing entertainment and providing community, but providing a way in which they could donate and raise money for others that were in need. So this was focused on small businesses at the time where that were in so much pain at that moment. 
not saying they've dug out of it even now, but at that point in time when everyone was closing up their small business, their restaurant, we wanted to do everything we could for small business owners across the United States by helping use this as a vehicle to raise money. And maybe also in a moment of levity to take your mind off what is occurring at that moment in time, right? To give you a break, a place to sit for an hour and enjoy some music from a musician or to watch a some some athletes game head to head against each other and you know why did we we put it in brave i think i was explaining that is the fact that it reached an audience in a whole nother way one it was easy i'm not gonna lie brave made it incredibly easy to to set up and to execute on i think from our team it was, it was bending the mindset of how media was spent for them and i think as well allowed us to test some new things that were early in the days of the ad vehicles for Brave, with some of the push notifications and others, uh, to see how uh, it would drive things. And I forget the metrics of the campaign. I think you have a case study on your site, but it did really well. Yeah, I, I just pulled up the case study, and anybody can see it. Just go to brave.com and hit the advertisers button and see case studies. And it had 23 million ad views, an 8% click through rate. 57% of the people clicked on the ad and spent 10 seconds or more on the landing page. And over a thousand tweets from the yeah. campaign itself. So that's impressive. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And we were really thankful to work with Brave on that as well. Good. So I know you get a little bit less involved on the media side of it, but you're still you still got your media chops. So from an agency perspective, are your clients talking about the removal of the third party cookies? Are they talking about privacy? or GDPR, or CCPA, or any of these things? And, and, and how are they preparing? Yeah, I think everyone is talking about it. And I think this is the conversation. All those topics are being discussed over and over again. I think right now, we've seen a lot of them take initial efforts, right, for the initial steps of how they're going to present it to the, the consumer when they have an interaction with them, how they're going to deal with it if they have to report on it how they can set up a way to be auditable uh, from it. But have they weaned themselves from the taste of that that good chocolate chip cookie? No, not yet. And I think it's not really the brands and the client base that are they're leading this. I think in the end, it's going to be them that push for it. But it's really been the, the platforms they're so used to using for advertising, right? This is how it's been done for a long time. RGA, we've been preparing it for a while. I think originally what interests us the most when we first looked at Brave was that whole me mentality. We knew we know it's coming. We knew it was coming. We just didn't know how fast it was going to move. I would say if we didn't have some of the circumstances we've had the last two years with health across the globe, it would have moved faster. And I think today we were keeping our eye on it over and over again. We watched this pretty intently. We're also starting to see a lot of other companies in the media tech realm quietly walking out some new features, some new products, some changes in the way that they're looking at things. And we're starting to take a look uh, deeper at that. So I think like by this time next year, I think the conversation will be completely different. I think that Google's pause of some of the actions they were going to take is a hindrance to some of that activity when they should have moved forward on it. It is what it is. It's not my business. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, what was your reaction when you saw that they're delaying it by another couple of years? I thought it was uh, a little ridiculous, to be honest. You know, I thought this is something that quite easily can be solved and is being solved. And uh, look, I, things are always more complex. I don't work for them, and I don't know how all the things are set and built. But if they had that intention prior to do that, they had a plan to go out and be able to, to make that happen. Something else happened along the way, and it might have been from a legislative perspective. I don't know. I don't know where, where that pressure came from and uh, where that decided to change. But what I think we'll see is with Apple and with others, it's an opportunity, right? Move as fast as you can in the space to give the consumer, I think, what they expect now, what they want now. I mean, if you look at a lot of the studies and a lot of the data out there, we want to know how our data is being used. I think, Donnie, you know, there's like really two products out there. Either you sell things to people or you sell people to things. And I think that this is uh, more common knowledge with the general America now of how they're the product in some cases with products that are free or perceived to be free. You I are think the product. You always hear that all the time. <laughs> and yeah, and I think uh, users and consumers are being uh, awoken to that. They're finally realizing that 
this isn't really for free. They're spying on me. They're taking all my data. They're targeting me with ads. I'm not, what I do online is not private anymore. People get it. I think like data ownership is going to be that next thing. We've looked at a lot of companies like Concord and others out there, Ad Lightning, that are looking at how they can actually provide that kind of data vault. Every consumer in the end will have some type of data vault, just like you have might have a password system that you pay for and manage. You might actually have a data vault. It might be in the browser itself through a wallet or other system, but it might be a standalone software product as well that might become more commonplace. So you work on a lot of creative campaigns. Are there some that come to mind right now that are capturing customers' attention? Attentions are just probably the most important part of this. I think over the last three or four years, our attention span has been totally changed. Is it capturing our attention? Usually it's capture attention with, wow, I love this, and it blows up for two or three hours or two or three days, and then gets quiet again because that cycle, the news cycle, the information cycle, the attention cycle spins a lot faster. Or it is from an outrage because someone did something that others don't agree with. So like, it's tough, right? Creative campaigns that are capturing attention, that attention cycle and window is a lot tighter. So the impact has to be a lot greater. There was one today that I love. I was actually going to share with a few folks I saw today from the North Face. And maybe it just hit a chord with me, but it's called Have You Ever? And I just it just came out today. But it really hit a lot of things I'm working on right now and just being out in the woods and rivers lately. This is a whole campaign connected with me, not just about the brands or the brands inside of them, but really those moments. Uh, Have you ever tasted tasted a river out in nature? Have you ever? It was a really good, quick video ad that I thought a lot of people are going to identify with quick. And it wasn't directly selling you anything besides experience. Yeah. So what was the creative on that North Face ad? You doing the things outside, like they had one, have you ever yelled at a rock and had a rock climber taking, making that next reach where you're screaming as you're going up the face and had people jumping in lakes and rivers. Have you ever tasted, have you tasted a river this summer? All these types of things. It was just very experiential and even just put you into that moment, but at no point in time were there their logos or gear or anything else inserted into it. So we talked about privacy as being a threat to our industry. What else comes to mind as like the biggest threat or most pressing challenge facing the the marketing or advertising industry now? Like always, but maybe even more so judge and measures time and attention. I think the amount of money that gets spent across media nowadays, and even we talked about this 10 years ago, this massive switch to digital that can be so highly and fractionally measured is really has to perform. And I think at times people say, well, you get too far down in the weeds of trying to micro target these small niche audiences with very unique, you know, a hundred versions of content and A-B tests. And if you've done the ad and it reaches the, the largest, broadest audience, maybe we're doing the right job there. So that's probably the biggest thing for us right now. Threat wise, you know, threat wise is just the change. I think, you know, what you're talking about from a Brave standpoint, we know how performance works, right? From an Apple and iOS standpoint, we know how overall performance works, but we can't now micro react off of it as we might've done before. We will be able to, we will have, have things that'll work and find it, find its way forward. But I think at this point in time, that's the challenge, right? How do we react really fast when a large organization makes a change? Even if they told you this change is coming for three months or longer, How do you then react to it? A lot of people are caught flat-footed. We've seen them in the DTC space that have relied so heavily on a lot of this for retargeting and micro-targeting and cross-platform targeting. They got hit hard. We saw a lot of DTC brands and startups fall flat for a a month and a half and regain their footing and, and growth afterwards, but it hit. So, You think we'll ever move to an area where advertisers are paying for Actual attention versus a CPM or a CPC? I would love it. Do I I think it's possible 100%. It's being proven by a lot of platforms and brands right now. They're trying it out. I think we also had, looking back, pay for performance mentality. I would say way back in the day, we were paying for performance. That's, in a sense, the way that, that we're doing that as well. I mean, there was a early video company, I forget what the name was, but 
they just pay college students to watch videos. College students, you know, they have no, no shortage of time to watch videos. But that was how they got paid for attention. They would win a credit based upon the attention they paid to that brand. Oh, do they watch the ad? We're seeing that same attention mentality be played in front of us right now while it's still paid for by CPM in Netflix, right? With pre-rolls that are happening in there, in YouTube, with pre-rolls are happening there. Like, whether you know it or not, the only one that's not being paid for it is you. You are being targeted by attention in these new models. But the one that's left out of that is the consumer. Or maybe the consumer is getting that product for free or at a discounted rate for that trade for time in the ad. But you know, I think there's a better model that evolves out of this. You know, we've looked at some uh, models right now over in Africa that are developing. If you look at the telecom space, where cell phone and data is incredibly expensive still across Africa. And if there was a way that I actually compensate you for time and attention, that actually went towards the cost of your monthly cell phone bill. And that's something that's being tested over there, right? Attention is being rewarded in a crypto format uh, across mobile devices by some brands that are producing content, especially in the music. And obviously, Brave, we give 70% of the advertiser dollars back to the user we are rewarding users for their attention, for turning on ads. But I wouldn't say that we're going yet towards advertisers paying based on uh, time spent or attention. It's still CPM or CPC. So we have some work to do. You know, of course, these models don't change overnight, right? Yeah. There's all sorts of mechanisms in place of how everyone's been compensated over the last 40 years, right? To turn that on a dime is really hard. The only thing that's going to push that it's if nationally, not statewide, federally, we have some bills put in place or some changes pushed down on the industry. And that's going to hurt a lot of people, right, immediately. But it's also going to be a forcing function to make people do things in new ways. A lot of time, pain brings opportunity. Can you nominate another brave marketer that we should have on this show? I have two I love, and they share a common past. Musa Tariq, who's the CMO at GoFundMe uh, in L.A., and the other is Jesse Stolak, who has just returned from Converse to be the new uh, VP of marketing for Nike. Those two both cross points of the same team at some time at Nike, but totally different approaches to things, uh, very human and story focused. And the things that I watch Musa do with GoFundMe today in really driving a massive impact to so many humans and individuals and how they're refocusing it. And the same thing I look from Jesse from the work he's just done with Converse and stretching Converse into what it should be back to its roots, back into the communities it serves have been really interesting to watch. And finally, Dylan, how can our users or our listeners get in touch with you? Best way to find me is Twitter at DT Boyd. People in my company laugh. They're like, oh, don't slack him. Don't text him. Don't eh, send him a DM. Definitely. That's the message platform of choice for me. If anyone's reached out and talked to me, I'm happy to make time. I usually set aside 10% of my week for serendipitous meetings that I hadn't planned. Nice. And what's the T stand for? Thurston. It's an old family name. You get one of one of three family names on the male side of the family. That's the one I got. Cool. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This was really fun. You're an excellent guest and you have a lot of great stories. Thanks, Donnie. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed that episode of The Brave Marketer with Dylan. I definitely enjoyed interviewing him a lot of great takeaways so i love his brave marketing story with kettle foods and personalizing the potato chip and now you see everything that's personalized i remember pay it forward campaign at the beginning of the pandemic with dave matthews and that was sponsored by verizon and we talked about that we talked about the attention economy how maybe one day advertisers will pay for our attention instead of cpm and cpc we will soon find out. But if you liked what you heard today and found it valuable, it'd be super helpful if you took two minutes to leave us a short review in Apple Podcasts. Every review counts in helping us get our show in more ears. And on a final note, if you have a brand, product, or service you'd like to get in front of Brave's 34 million users, please email us at adsales at brave.com and let us know your podcast listener to unlock one of two perks. If your budget is under $10,000 a month, we will bump you up to the top of our self-serve waiting list. Or if your budget is $10,000 or over a month, we'll qualify you for a 25% podcast listener discount. Just let us know. And again, email us at adsales at brave.com. 
Finally, huge shout out to my brother, Ari Devoren. All the music that you're hearing today goes to him. He's a great musician and father and friend out of Austin, Texas. So that's today's episode. Thank you again. And that's a wrap.